All right, we are on chapter 35 of the Copper Revolution, Healing with Minerals. Chapter 35, Mineral Composition of the Human Body, right from Wikipedia. And I am amazed this information is not censored, but here's an excerpt from the list at Wikipedia. Oxygen, 43 kilos. 65% of your body's mass is oxygen. Carbon, 16 kilos or 16,000 grams, is, which is 16 kilos. Hydrogen, 7,000 grams, which would be 7 kilos. Nitrogen, 1,800 grams. Calcium, 1,000 grams, or 1 kilo. Phosphorus, 780 grams, or 0.78 of a kilo. Potassium, 140 grams. Sulfur, 140 grams. Sodium, 100 grams. Chlorine, 95,000 milligrams or 95 grams. Magnesium, 19,000 milligrams or 19 grams. Trace minerals, iron, 4,200 milligrams, which lowers copper. Fluorine, 2,600 milligrams, which lowers copper and is a nerve toxin. Zinc, 2,300 milligrams, which lowers copper. Bromine, 260 milligrams, which is a nerve toxin. Lead, 120 milligrams, which lowers copper and is a nerve toxin. Copper, 72 milligrams. Aluminum, 60 milligrams, which is a nerve toxin. Iodine, only 20 milligrams. Boron, only 18 milligrams. Note, this is not a complete list. So about the major minerals, the medical establishment would have you believe that oxygen, comprising 65% of your body, is a poison. They use terms like oxidative damage. Well, show me the control group deprived of oxygen. Dead minutes. Science fiction says that we are a carbon-based life form. Maybe we're an oxygen-based life form. We actually have three times as much oxygen as carbon. The average person has one million milligrams or a kilo or 2.2 pounds of calcium in their bodies. Taking calcium supplements appears silly in that context. The body appears to know how to get it and hold on to it. We also have plenty of phosphorus in our bodies, 780 grams <clears throat> Or 7, 780,000 milligrams. That's over a pound. There are 454 grams per pound. We likely do not need to supplement phosphorus. We also get about 43 milligrams of phos phosphorus in a typical 250 milliliters of Coke. Often health advocates warn about this much phosphorus. I find that silly in context unless someone is drinking several liters of Coke in a day and it's the sugar that will harm you far more than the phosphorus. Sulfur is widely regarded as super toxic, yet we have about a third of a pound of sulfur in our bodies. It, uh, sulfur often smells like rotten eggs, and yet MSM sulfur and DMSO sulfur are touted as wonderful health supplements. Uh, in fact, we take MSM sulfur, which appears to be safer. Sodium and chlorine make up salt. If they were combined, we would have about two thirds of a pound of salt in our bodies. Chlorine is needed to make hydrochloric acid in the stomach to aid digestion. I have heard other people say that uh, copper helps the body retain salt. Salt is a major mineral needed for hydration. It helps the body hold on to water. Uh, dehydration and adre adrenal insufficiency have the same symptoms. Both are a lack of either salt uh, and, uh, or water and copper. I think a safer salt, just to interject here, is potassium chloride. I think it's a much better salt than sodium chloride. And again, about the trace minerals, iron and fluorine and zinc, the top three on the trace minerals list, all block copper, and lead also blocks copper. Fluorine, bromine, and lead are all toxins, neurotoxins, and all are on, uh, they're all above the list of where copper is, which is a key nerve healer. In other words, the average person has three neurotoxins in far greater quantities than copper, the nerve healer. That could explain quite a few problems. Uh, fluoride is detoxed by iodine, boron, copper, calcium, tamarind, leafy greens, turmeric, and li likely also sulfur and silica. <clears throat> Bromine is detoxed by iodine and uh, chlorides, like potassium chloride or magnesium chloride. If you start a high iodine program of 50 milligrams of iodine, you may need more chlorides to get through the bromine detox. Lead is detoxed by zinc. Lead, zinc, and silver are bound together in the earth as galena, a type of silver ore. 
Uh, some people believe that iron, because it blocks copper, is also a neurotoxin, or at least it acts like one. That would place four neurotoxins on the list that are above copper on the list. Thus, blaming copper for supposedly neurotoxic activity rather than those other four known neurotoxins is flat out not right. It's especially not right in light of the list of ways that copper helps the nerves in the brain. So in that list, at least four are known nerve toxins, and they should not be in the body at all. There's fluorine, bromine, lead, and aluminum. Now, zinc is not a neurotoxin, but all five microminerals on this list, listed above copper, are all <clears throat> blocking copper. Iron, if it in excess, fluorine, zinc, bromine, and lead. So this is the situation for the average person. So unless you took extra steps to detox each one of these, there are likely problems for you and me. Furthermore, just because you have an uh, average amount like other people does not mean these are not problems. The average American has 4,200 milligrams of iron in the body and only 72 milligrams of copper. So while iron can block copper, this might not be as bad as it sounds. There's about 3,500 milligrams of that iron is already a part of your red blood cells where it belongs. Some might be in the bone marrow making new blood cells. So only excess iron would be bad and copper helps to prevent the excess iron, presuming you no longer have any signs of copper deficiency. As I was writing this book, I had the chance to speak with Morley Robbins. He explained that iron is usually measured by the blood, but the cells can contain 10 times as much iron. And if iron in the cells is high, iron, blood iron is low. And if iron in the cells is low, iron in the blood can be high. Then it's like this with copper as well. So blood tests, may accurately test what's in the blood, but they are not accurate indicators of what's in the body. Getting back to it, the average American has 2,600 milligrams of fluoride in the body and only 72 milligrams of copper. This is 36 times more fluoride than copper. This is very bad. Why? Because fluoride blocks copper. Conversely, the good news is that copper detoxes fluoride because they bind together. Well, which process wins? Well, we need over twice the weight of copper to bind fluoride, and at that ratio, they block each other. So that's the ratio needed to make a copper to fluoride molecule. So we need at least twice as much copper as fluoride or more to detox the fluoride, not 1 36th of the amount. Fortunately, iodine and boron can also detox copper, but clearly the average person does not get nearly enough of those either. And note also they're at the bottom of the list, list with the smallest amounts in the body. Remember a few chapters before, fluoride blocks copper by 10%. Well, again, that was in people with skeletal fluorosis compared to average people who have 2,600 milligrams of fluoride and only 72 milligrams of copper, with the average person being mild or subclinical skeletal fluorosis. So when they said that uh, fluoride blocks copper, they're comparing very heavily fluoridated people with heavily fluoridated people to get that 10% worse of blocking the copper. So fluoride actually might be a lot worse. Why? Again, there's no control group of people without fluoride. There's no control group of people who have taken the high copper also at over 20 milligrams for a few years, there except me and my wife. And we've been on it four years now. There's no control group of people who've not been exposed to fluoride and who have taken high copper regularly for health. Unfortunately, my wife and I have both been explored, exposed to fluoride. I used to drink uh, red wine. I used to eat a lot of dried fruit. Uh, my wife was exposed to fluoride uh, medications. So we really don't know how badly fluoride affects copper, and it's likely far worse than the 10% that the study suggested. On the other hand, maybe it's not quite that bad. If most fluoride is not actively creating harm to the nerves, then where is it? Most of the fluoride is probably in the bones as fluoride does get attracted to calcium. I found later in my studies that yes, 99% of the fluoride is in the bones. And this has several implications. But first, here's a study on the lack of effects of copper at 10 milligrams over 90 days. Lack of effects of copper gluconate supplementation. Quote, a double blind study was done giving 10 milligrams of copper per day as copper gluconate or placebo capsules for 12 weeks. The seven subjects receiving copper gluconate had no change in the level of copper in the serum, urine, or hair. There was also no change in the levels of zinc or magnesium. There was also no significant change in the levels of hematocrit, triglyceride, SGOT, GGT, LDH, cholesterol, or alkaline 
phosphatase. The side effects of nausea, diarrhea, and heartburn were the same in the subjects receiving copper gluconate and subjects receiving placebo capsules. So in short-term studies over about two to three months, people who take copper at 10 to 20 milligrams do not hold on to very much copper. Rather, they excrete almost all of it. Well, 90 days of 10 milligrams of copper is only 900 milligrams of copper. This is not enough to detox 2,600 milligrams of fluoride, the fluoride burden of the average person. We actually need, again, twice as much copper by weight, by milligrams, as fluoride, twice as much copper as fluoride to create a molecule of one copper atom to two fluoride atoms because fluoride is so light. So even the very high 20 milligrams is only 1,800 milligrams of copper over three months, which is still only a third as much copper as needed to detox the fluoride. So maybe a person has to get past most of the fluoride detox in order to get most of the benefits of copper. Maybe copper, since it's easily excreted, uh, maybe it's a perfect detoxer for fluoride. Maybe a person with copper deficiency disease needs even more copper, both to get past the fluoride detox and iron detox and get enough to cure their copper deficiency. This would take time and it would likely require people to slowly ramp up copper intake to get past the nausea problem and initial stages of fluoride detox. And or it would require a topical copper application to get past the problem of nausea in the stomach. I would naturally assume that the body can hold at least as much of a vital nutrient as it could hold a toxin and do that without damage. And thus a healthy body could get copper levels up to and over 2,600 milligrams instead of the usual 72 milligrams. The iodine doctors, <clears throat> Abraham, Brownstein, and Fleckus, have already made a similar argument. They postulate that the body can hold up to thousands of milligrams of iodine rather than just 30 milligrams or so by the time the body is fully saturated with iodine. I assume the same thing could happen with copper as well. In fact, there is evidence that human bodies can hold over several thousand milligrams of copper, as some people who take a copper chelating agent excrete over 2,000 milligrams of copper in the urine in one single day. Uh, link to a study, Disorders of Mental Metabolism. Urinary excretion of 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of copper within 24 hours after oral administration of, of one gram penicillamine is diagnostic. See, so people can hold up to 2,000 milligrams of copper or more. Again, the usual is only 72 milligrams to maybe 150 milligrams of copper. So that's evidence that most people are woefully copper deficient, only having 72 milligrams of copper in the body when it could be a lot more. Again, every cell in the human body wants both iodine and copper. Now, admittedly, the 2,000 milligrams of copper excreted is usually diagnostic of Wilson's disease, but I will examine Wilson's disease in a chapter later. Uh, see also Wikipedia, Essential Chemical Elements for Humans. Thank you. That's it for that chapter.